Right now on Morning News Now, response ready. President Biden says he's decided how to retaliate after a drone strike killed three American soldiers in Jordan. We have new details. Yes. Administration officials say the U.S. is not looking for a wider war with Iran, but some experts are worried the two countries may be careening toward an all-out conflict. Meanwhile, families of the remaining hostages in Gaza are waiting to find out if their loved ones could soon be coming home. But we've learned about a new proposal that could be the key. Also this morning, Capitol Hill clash. Overnight, House Republicans advanced the impeachment of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, and it's now headed for a bitter battle on the House floor. All as the fate of a bipartisan bill on border security hangs in the balance as senators try to strike a deal. And we're remembering two-time Tony winner Cheetah Rivera. We look back at the life and legacy of the woman who starred in the original Broadway productions of Chicago and West Side Story. A legend in every sense of the world. Looking forward to celebrating her life. Good morning. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We begin our show with the ongoing fallout from Sunday's drone attack that killed three U.S. soldiers in northeastern Jordan. The U.S. says it was carried out by an Iran-backed group in the region. As he departed the White House yesterday, President Biden said he has decided on a response to the attack, but he did not elaborate on what that would be. NBC News senior White House reporter Peter Nicholas joins us now. Peter, I know we are getting some new information. Uh, from U.S. officials about what that response could look like. What are we hearing? Well, we're hearing that the response could take uh, weeks and not days, that this is not going to be a one-off retaliatory strike. Um, the president uh, obviously doesn't want to telegraph what his moves are going to be, but uh, NBC News has learned that it will probably include Iranian targets uh, in several countries. Um, there are some uh, Republicans in Congress who would like to see uh, the U.S. hit Iranian soil directly, but it's unlikely that Biden will do that. Uh, he doesn't want to escalate this. He doesn't want a wider war, as he said. The militant group that claimed responsibility for Sunday's attack, they released a statement yesterday. It says they're suspending operations against U.S. forces. Walk us through this. Why is this? What's the reaction been from the U.S.? And then could there be any indication that this impacts the president's response? The U.S. is not putting very much stock in this at all. Uh, the Pentagon spokesman has uh, issued a statement basically saying actions speak louder than words. There's very little likelihood that this is going to deter the U.S. retaliatory strike. Biden is under a lot of pressure to respond uh, to avenge these deaths of U.S. soldiers and to show that um, Iranian-backed um, militia groups cannot target American uh, troops with impunity. So he, uh, I don't think that... Uh, this statement is going to have much uh, impact on the U.S. retaliatory response. Uh, Peter, we understand the president has spoken <clears throat> with the victim's families. What can you tell us about that and any plans to try and bring them home? Yes, uh, there will be a dig what's called a dignified transfer that will take place on Friday. President Biden has spoken to the families and essentially asked if, uh, if they would want him there to be present. And sometimes these are very fraught moments. The families are under understandably distraught, and families have signaled that they do want President Biden to attend. I mean, he's someone who has suffered grievous loss in his own own right. I mean, he lost a son, Bo, um, who served in Iraq. He lost his wife and daughter in the early 1970s in a car crash. And this business of consoling families who are grieving is something that he excels at and uh, is important to him. So he will be there. All right. Peter Nicholas, thank you so much. Appreciate your reporting this morning. Well, sources tell NBC News that Hamas is reviewing a U.S.-backed proposal to release the remaining hostages being held in Gaza, along with a 60-day ceasefire. The deal follows a series of high-level talks in Paris between officials from Israel, the U.S., and Qatar. It is the first time negotiations have seemingly resumed since late November. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley has the details. So that deal to try to free those more than 100 hostages, including six Americans still being held on the Gaza Strip, is coming along, but slowly. We just heard yesterday that White House National Security Advisor met with some of the families of some of those American hostages. He updated them on the negotiations and tried to reassure them of the administration's commitment to freeing them. But this has been a really thorny issue here, so thorny that the U.S. dispatched the head of the CIA, Bill Burns, to Paris over the weekend to try to hash out 
a deal, not with Hamas necessarily, but with other parties. He met, uh, and this is just rehashing, he met with his counterparts from Israel and Egypt and with the prime minister of Qatar. They came up with a proposal that is now in Hamas's hands, and it would basically say two months, some reporting has said six weeks, of a pause in the fighting in exchange for an exchange of prisoners, Palestinian prisoners, three of them for each Israeli or American held in the Gaza Strip. Now, that is still controversial, and not just on the Hamas side. Hamas has asked that, uh, that they will only release all of those prisoners if Israel agrees to a full and final ceasefire, something that Israel has so far rejected. But even here in Israel, there's some opposition to freeing those hostages too cheaply. And that's the word we're kind of hearing bandied about by some right-wing ministers and politicians who say they don't want to see Palestinian prisoners some of whom have been implicated in very serious terrorism charges, others less serious charges, hitting the streets once again in exchange for not enough. And that's why this has become so controversial, even as we're seeing families of the hostages protesting in Jerusalem and here in Tel Aviv, often in front of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's home. The pressure on him is substantial. But now we're hearing that Hamas has been invited to Cairo. Now, uh, Israeli reporting says that Hamas uh, delegation is arriving in Cairo today. NBC News has not confirmed that. Um, but this could mean that this deal could be moving slowly forward. And we might have more news next week. All right, Matt Bradley, thank you so much. Early this morning, House Republicans on the Homeland Security Committee voted along party lines to advance two articles impeach of impeachment against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. The committee met all day yesterday to debate the merits of impeaching Mayorkas, accusing him and the Biden administration of disregarding federal laws on immigration. Mayorkas, however, has called the accusations against him baseless. A vote by the full House of Representatives is now expected as early as next week. This comes as a bipartisan group of lawmakers continues working toward a deal on border security. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says progress is being made. All through the weekend, negotiators continued their work on the National Security Supplemental. We are approaching the finish line, but the work is not done. For the first time in over a decade, we have a golden opportunity to make meaningful, lasting changes to the southern border. The best chance we will likely have in a good while. For the latest on the border, we're joined by NBC News correspondent David Noriega in Eagle Pass, Texas, and NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin. David, let's begin with you. Eagle Pass has been one of the flashpoints along the border. What's the latest you're hearing, and what are some of the main concerns that people might have there? Hey guys, good morning. Yeah, so in terms of migrant crossings here in Eagle Pass, things have actually quieted down quite a bit, especially compared to where they were last month. Last month you had just the borders right behind me. I don't know if you can see it in the dark, but you had tens of thousands of people crossing the border at this point over the course of December. That number has dropped precipitously, probably mostly due to seasonal fluctuations in, in, in migration patterns that you see pretty much every year. Nevertheless, you can still feel the political tensions quite strongly here. Just down the way is the uh, a park that Texas authorities took over to prevent Border Patrol access to the river and to, uh, uh, to prevent migrants from turning themselves over to Border Patrol to seek asylum. <clears throat> You also have a lot of people who are anticipating the arrival of a convoy of Trump supporters, self-described patriots, who are meant to arrive here later this week. It's unclear how much size that convoy is actually gathering or how much of an event it's actually going to be. But we've already spoken to and seen several people trickling in, in some cases, from many hours away, different parts of Texas, in anticipation of that convoy. I've also spoken to some uh, community members, just regular residents here of Eagle Pass, who sort of feel like they're stuck in the middle of this political battle between Texas Republicans and the Biden administration, some of whom are upset that they no, no longer have access to their beloved park, have also felt overwhelmed by the arrival of large numbers of migrants, and generally just wish that someone would do something to, uh, to, to take care of this issue. Mm. Back to you guys. Julie, let's bring you in here, talk about what we've seen on the Hill. So Mayorkas could potentially be the first cabinet secretary to be impeached in 150 years. What are some of the key takeaways from yesterday's hearing? 
Yeah, guys, this was an all-day hearing, all-night hearing. They didn't vote until well into the night, but they did end up approving two articles of impeachment. Uh, the Homeland Security Chairman, Mark Green, the committee in the House, uh, he actually said that, that uh, Mayorkas does deserve to be impeached based on these two articles, willfully ignoring uh, the will of the law, willfully ignoring and not enforcing the law that Congress has passed, and also breaching public trust. Democrats tried to stall this as much as they could. They kept pointing to the fact that, look, we do have a bipartisan border solution emerging. Let's focus on that instead of going down this political process, as they called it. Take a listen to some of the exchanges between Mark Green, the chairman, and the ranking member, Benny Thompson, on the panel. We have not approached this day or this process lightly. Secretary Mayorkas' actions have forced our hand. We cannot allow this border crisis to continue. We cannot allow a cabinet secretary with no regard for the separation of powers or the rule of law to remain in office. In a process akin to throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks, Republicans have cooked up vague, unprecedented grounds to impeach Secretary Mayorkas. Now, nonetheless, all the back and forth didn't stop the committee from approving this on a party line vote. Just in the last minute, we got a statement from the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson. I want to read you just a little part of it. He commended the passage of these impeachment articles in the House Committee, the Homeland Security Committee. Uh, he said this was an exhaustive investigation. He called this a solemn step they didn't want to take, but they had to take, according to Johnson. Again, that vote on the full House floor could happen as early as next week, though it has not yet been nailed down. So, Julie, that's the House. Meanwhile, in this Senate, you have these efforts to try and reach a deal to secure the border. What's the latest on that? And what's the reaction to President Biden's assertion that he does want the authority to shut down the border? Exactly, guys. This is going to be released as part of the full supplemental security package. Remember what this is all about. The border issue needs to be fixed, according to Republicans, who said this months ago in order to unlock foreign aid to Ukraine, to Israel, to Taiwan, all these key issues that the Biden administration wants to get settled soon. Now, Schumer, the majority leader of Democrats in the Senate, has said that they're not there yet. They're still putting the finishing touches on it. But what we've been able to see in our reporting that's part of this pr proposal is it is very conservative. It will give, essentially, it will mandate an authority for the administration to shut down the border once they see migrant crossings reach a, a daily average over seven days of 5,000 or exceeding 8,500 in one day. This is really significant. It'll be interesting to see how Republicans respond to it. Once that text is released, I'm told the goal is potentially tomorrow. Maybe it'll slide into Friday. Certainly, they still have some finishing touches to put on it. Take a listen to what Schumer had to say on the floor. It's entirely unsurprising and truly disappointing at the same time that many on the hard right, including Donald Trump, are now trying to thwart this bipartisan effort for the sake of electoral politics. But here in the Senate, both sides have an obligation to tune the partisan noise out and to continue working. Bipartisanship is the only way that action on the border is going to happen. So listen, uh, Johnson has not said flat out that he will not put this on the floor, but certainly all eyes are on the Senate. If they can manage to really get this done, to get this out and get this on the floor and then pass it with enough Republicans and Democrats supporting it, it will certainly put a lot of pressure on Johnson, even though he is being pressured by the former president and some of those hard right members. David, I, I want to know if you could tell us more about this ongoing divide between the White House and then Texas Governor Greg Abbott over the handling of migrants at the southern border. What are you hearing on the ground and where do things stand now? Yeah, Savannah, so for a couple of years now, Governor Abbott has been carrying out what he calls Operation Lone Star. That includes a, a number of different sort of actions here on the border, everything from putting razor wire along the banks of the Rio Grande here to new fencing to most recently taking over Shelby Park, which was one of the main crossing points that migrants were using to get on Texas ground. That has led, this has led to a, a pretty substantial conflict between the government of Texas and the federal government. The way that, the, the way that this plays out on the ground is a little bit more complicated complicated between rank and file border patrol officers and Texas National Guard and, and, uh, and, and Texas state troopers. They actually tend to often work together on these things. So the divide is more on the national level between Biden and Abbott and the federal government and the state government than it is between <clears throat> 
the agents of these actual agencies. And, you know, just being here on the ground, I've been asking myself the question, this is a pretty good test case for do these policies on the ground, do these measures really work when all is said and done, right? Texas says that these are deterrent measures. They're intended to, to dissuade migrants from trying to make the crossing into the U.S. Um, wh when you talk to people who've been, for example, representing criminal defense attorneys who've, who've been representing the migrants who Texas arrests as part of Operation Lone Star, <clears throat> They say that those migrants wind up back in immigration custody uh, anyway after they've gone through uh, uh, Texas state criminal procedures and are often once again released into the country to await their asylum cases, which is what would normally have happened anyway. The numbers have also still been going up. Last, last month we saw record numbers here in Texas. So a lot of people, especially here in the community, see these Operation Lone Star measures as largely political rather than substantive border management issues. Obviously the, the state of Texas would disagree with that assessment. That's a big part of the debate that's going on on the ground right now. Back All right, to you. David and Julie with the latest on what's happening at the border. Thank you both. Well, the Justice Department is investigating Missouri Congresswoman Cori Bush for her campaign spending on security services. According to the St. Louis Post Dispatch, Bush's use of funds first came into question last February after she married her security guard, who then remained on her campaign payroll while providing security for the congresswoman. The Justice Department subpoenaed the office of the House Sergeant at Arms for documents related to the matter. Bush denies any wrongdoing, and she says she is fully cooperating in the investigation. Well, the West Coast is getting slammed with heavy rain, winds, and snow. For more on this wet, wintry mix, let's get a check on your forecast. Yeah, meteorologist Angie Lastman joins us with that. Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. We've got another storm system that's working in and bringing ample amounts of rain. We've got some snow on the table and some strong winds, and this is going to be impacting folks across the West over the next couple of days. Here's the deal right now. We're starting off quite soggy. We're going to continue to see this kind of scenario lasting for the next couple of days, and we've got plenty of alerts up already. We've got more more than 20 million people under flood alerts, mostly across portions of California, including Southern California and stretching into San Francisco and points north of that. We've got wind alerts for 25 million people, and we've got winter alerts in effect as well for some of those mountain ranges. Let's start with the, how this plays out over the next couple of days. We've got this specific storm system, Pineapple Express, bringing us plenty of moisture beelining from Hawaii, basically all the way into the California coast. And this means that there's going to be an enhanced risk for some flooding over the next couple of days, specifically San Fran up into portions of Oregon. That's where we're going to see the best chance of some of the heaviest of the rain. But that doesn't mean we're not going to get a good soaking rain and the potential for flooding uh, for points south of that. We'll see this system work inland, but the rain doesn't stop. We're still going to see uh, some snow and some rain here as we get into the day tomorrow. And then the Rockies and parts of the desert southwest will start to see some rain and snow spread into those regions. That happens by the time the end of the work week rolls around. Meanwhile, uh, as we get through those next couple of days, some really good substantial rain. We could see isolated amounts 6 to 10 inches at the King Range, coastal areas, all on the table for so, seeing some of those higher amounts. And when we're talking about snow, we could see up to 4 feet in some spots across uh, those mountain ranges. So we've got places like Mammoth, we've got Sequoia National Park seeing some of those higher amounts. Uh, and if, so, of course, across the Sierra Range, we're going to be watching that. Meanwhile, right now, because we've had such a, a kind of warm El Nino uh, situation with the storms, that that, that means we've had more rain than snow in this region, so we really could use some snow across this area. Northern Sierra coming in only at 60% of snowpack for the average of what they usually see, even less than that as you go farther south into central Sierra and even farther uh, south into southern Sierra, 35% for the snowpack. So really could use some of those uh, couple of inches in up to feet in those regions. The winds are going to be another problem for folks across this area, 40, 50 mile per hour wind gusts are possible. Crescent City coming in at 55 mile per hour wind potentially here as we get into the evening hours tonight. So heads up for folks there. The travel will be difficult. Not only will we have the rain, but we'll also have some snow across that, uh, that part of the country, guys. But the mountain snow will continue into Friday and into the weekend. And we've got another storm system on deck by the time the weekend ends for them. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Angie. Appreciate Thank you. it. Legendary Broadway performer Cheetah Rivera has passed away at the age of 91. Rivera was best known for her roles in West Side Story, Chicago, and Kiss of the Spider Woman. This morning, NBC News correspondent Rahima Ellis reflects on her trailblazing life and legacy.
Cheetah Rivera was always more than great. I'm so lucky. And to see her dance, it's clear. Her success was way more than luck. Born in Washington, D.C. in 1933 with the full name... Dolores Conchita Figueroa de Rivero, Montestuco, Florentina, Canimacro de Fluente. As a child, she took ballet and by 16 won a scholarship to the American School of Ballet in New York to dance with the famed George Balanchine. Once a dancer, always a dancer. Actually, she was a triple threat, dancing, acting, and singing her way into the very history of the American musical. From the classic West Side Story, originating the role of Anita, navigating racial prejudices in the 1960s. It wasn't just a show. You know, it was information about what's happening. To the all-American Bye Bye Birdie, to a seedier America in Chicago. And all that jazz. Nominated numerous times for a Tony and winning twice for the rink. Thank you for this. What a wonderful honor. And the kiss of the Spider Woman, which marked a triumphant return to the stage after a devastating car crash that required 16 pins to fix a broken leg. But she never stopped dancing, working on Broadway well into her 80s. Her life measured in accomplishments. The first Hispanic woman to receive the Kennedy Center Award, a Tony Lifetime Achievement Award, a Presidential Medal of Freedom. Like her unforgettable Anita, Cheetah Rivera has shown that life can indeed be bright in America. And a successful one-woman show. It's what I love, love, love to do. And Cheetah Rivera lived it to the fullest. Miss Rivera, you're on. Good. Rahima Ellis, NBC News. She was life. so good. <laughs> what a life, too, at 91. Oh, what a great look back. Well, coming up, are you bougie broke? We're going to dig into what that term means and what it tells us about how millennials are spending their money. But first, the push to protect children on social media heading to Capitol Hill with some of the biggest names in tech set to testify in front of lawmakers today. That story next. Welcome back. The Illinois State Board of Elections voted unanimously to keep former President Donald Trump on the ballot ahead of that state's primary on March 19th. The board is both Republican and Democratic members. Their vote rejects a challenge from petitioners that Trump should be disqualified because of his role in the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. They claim he violated Section 3 of the 14th Amendment by engaging in an insurrection that day. Trump's lawyer says the former president did not incite an insurrection and never advocated violence at the Capitol. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court is set to hear oral arguments next week in the Colorado case after the state's Supreme Court ruled Trump to be ineligible to appear on that ballot, also citing the 14th Amendment. Well, today on Capitol Hill, the heads of major social media companies are set to testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee about keeping kids safe online. The high-profile hearing comes as efforts to regulate social media nationwide ramp up, sparked by concerns from parents. NBC News youth and internet culture reporter Callan Rosenblatt joins us now with more on what we can expect ahead of this hearing. Hi, Callan. Good morning. So this is the CEOs of TikTok, Meta, Snap, X, all these major platforms that are expected to testify. What information is the Senate Judiciary Committee looking for to specifically from these leaders? Good morning, Savannah and Joe. So it appears these uh, leaders on Capitol Hill, what they're looking for is information about how these tech CEOs are planning to protect children from harmful content, particularly from content that sexually exploits children and that is sexually exploitive that children could access. So they're really going to look to hear how these tech CEOs are planning to prevent this content from getting to children, but also how children, how they're pre pre uh, planning to prevent children from partaking in this kind of content. Additionally, it appears that they're going to be looking for these tech CEOs to make commitments to legislation that's already circulating in Washington, D.C. For example, uh, ahead of this hearing, Snap, which is Snapchat, uh, has already come out in favor of the Kids Online Safety Act, which is also known as COSA. Now, that's an act that is is bipartisan. It's gotten a lot of support on Capitol Hill. And experts tell me this law looks great on paper, but could be very difficult to enforce in practice. So it looks like these uh, these leaders, these lawmakers are looking to get these sort of um, th these assurances from these tech CEOs. But experts say that, you know, it, it may not be as simple as just signing up or supporting these pieces of legislation. 
So, Callan, have we seen any significant progress among social media companies in their efforts to try and create safeguards to help keep kids safe online? Could we see some concrete steps come out of this hearing today? Joe, it appears that these social media companies are constantly trying to create safer environments for children and to keep harmful content off of these platforms. Now, they've constantly been rolling out uh, these safeguards, even ahead of this hearing, Meta rolling out uh, ways for parents to be able to uh, supervise and prevent certain messages getting to their young children. But is it enough for these lawmakers? We constantly see these stories come out about how social media negatively impacts young people's mental health, how these sexually explicit content, uh, including some AI-generated content, gets onto these platforms. And it seems that these lawmakers want more concrete evidence that these tools work. I'm sure we'll see more tools come out of this a particular hearing, but it seems a constant cat and mouse game trying to keep up with this kind of content. Callan, this comes at a time when we've seen a lot of attempted legislation across the country about social media companies, right? Montana trying to ban TikTok altogether, Florida trying to raise the minimum age for teens to be able to use this to 16. And we're also kind of suddenly hearing these CEOs for the first time back some of this legislation. Do you think that says anything about how they're feeling or how concerned they might be about some of this legislation? Yeah, I mean, I think we're at a point where people are kind of scrambling and asking for oversight at this point, right? I mean, we see a lot of laws coming out at the state level that are looking to protect child labor on these platforms. And so it does appear that there is this push to get some regulation out there. But as I mentioned, experts say it's kind of messy. This COSA law or this uh, it's the Kids Online Safety Act. You know, it, it would basically enshrine that these platforms have to protect their young users. But what is harmful content? I mean, that, that has a wide range. And if each state is sort of enforcing it on a different level, we may see this fracture of information. So it's a really hard space to regulate. And social media, as we all know, is very nebulous. And it can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. But the fact of the matter is people really do want to see some regulation for social media platforms. And we have to start somewhere. I think people are looking at this legislation as at least a start. All right. Callan Rosenblatt, thank you so much. Let's get to some international news. New this morning, an already convicted former Pakistani prime minister has been hit with a fresh jail sentence just one day after receiving a 10-year jail term. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga joins us with that and other world headlines. Hey, Claudio, good morning. Savannah Joe, good morning. Well, that's right. The former Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, and his wife were both uh, issued a sentence of 14 years in jail after a court found them guilty of graft. Now, the couple is accused of being involved in the legal sale of state gifts for profit while Khan was still in office. The sentence comes only a day, as you mentioned, after Khan was handed over a separate 10-year jail term for leaking state secrets, although it's not clear whether the two sentences will be concurrent or consecutive. Now, Imran Khan says the charges and arrests are politically motivated. Before the trials, political analysts saw him as the likely winner of Pakistan's upcoming general election on February the 8th. Let's now go to Canada, where several players in the country's 2018 World Junior Team have been charged with sexual assault. Among them are four NHL players, Carter Hart of the Philadelphia Flyers, Michael McLeod uh, of the, and Cal Foot of the New Jersey Devils, and Dylan Dube of the Calgary Flames. Attorneys representing the players denied any wrongdoing on behalf of their clients. A Devils spokesperson said the organization is aware of the reports and have been told to refer all inquiries to the league. While well, a Flyers spokesperson said the team, and I quote, will respond appropriately to this very serious manner when the outcomes of this investigation are made public. And let's end this tour of the world in Paris, where the city's public transport system said it will be using artificial intelligence to help thousands of international visitors navigate through the French capital during the Summer Olympics. 3,000 agents will be provided with a handheld device that, will tra that can translate between French and 16 different languages, with text appearing on the screen as well as being read out loud. Now, this way, officers can direct visitors to wherever they want to go without a fear they get lost in translation. Well, guys, c'est formidable. Back to you. <laughs> no clue what you said. Yeah. It sounds great. <laughs> but that is a great idea. Very cool. Yes. Thanks, Claudio. Appreciate it. Well, use the handheld. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh. Coming up in an NBC News exclusive, our Lester Holt sits down with the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella. What he said about the rise of AI and the threat it could pose to our elections. That's up next.
We are back now with an exclusive interview with the head of one of the world's most valuable publicly traded companies, Microsoft. Since going all in on artificial intelligence, the tech giant has boomed under CEO Satya Nadella. NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt asked him about the technology's risks, the upcoming election, and what's next for the company. AI feels new to most of us who really kind of discovered its potential within the last year or so. But we talk about the exciting things, detecting and perhaps treating cancer. And then we talk about the worrisome thing, uh, fakes, fraud, disinformation. We've seen that already on the, in the political arena. Does it give you pause as to what the potential and how far you can take this? Absolutely, in the sense that one of the things that I, I feel that's very healthy is we're not just talking about all of the things this new technology can do, but we're also talking about the unintended consequences. We have learned, even as a tech industry, is that we have to simultaneously address both of these. How do you really amplify the benefits and dampen the unintended consequences? We're mar marching down the road to the first AI election. Are you holding your breath as to see what how AI can help and how it may be weaponized. In fact, it goes back again. Uh, this is not the first election where we dealt with uh, disinformation or propaganda campaigns uh, by adversaries and election interference. So therefore, I think what we have to go back again is, for example, I think we are doing all the work across the tech industry around watermarking, detecting deep fakes and content IDs. There's going to be enough and more technology, quite frankly in order to be able to identify the issues around disinformation and misinformation. Then the question again comes back to, how do we build consensus between parties, candidates, and the norms around what is acceptable, not acceptable? You've had the benefit, I presume, of being able to peek around the corner and see what's out there, see what may be coming. Does any of it make you want to put up a stop sign? With all of the technology, I, I am more in the camp of let us make sure that the technology ultimately is just a tool. Microsoft promotes its AI-powered co-pilot software as just that. This is not about replacing the human in the loop. In fact, it's about empowering the human. Like it's an assistant. It's an assistant. You've talked a lot about guardrails in the past and the need to regulate this industry. What is it? That, that needs to be under control. When I think about it, there are many, many areas we talked about even in our conversation, which is there is things people talk about if there is AI takeoff, right? One of the existential risks people talk about in AI is what if AI is so powerful that it's not in human control? That obviously is an existential issue for us. In our interview, we also discussed AI's impact on jobs. I think there will be new job creation, new skills picked up, uh, and yes, there will be overall displacement in the labor market, which I think will be much more dynamic than we gave labor markets credit for. I do want to ask you about the New York Times lawsuit against your partner, uh, OpenAI, and yourself about the idea of using their content, using New York Times content to train AI. It does kind of open up a thought about where this information comes from and who ultimately benefits. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things uh, that is very, going to be very, very important is both what is the copyright protection as well as what is fair use in a world where there is transformative new technology. I think that that's really where uh, the copyright laws have to essentially now be interpreted for what is a new transformation technology. We have done this in the past. I'm sure we'll come out with, with the right set of guidelines on what is used for training. And we talked about the recent hack on Microsoft corporate systems that the company says was carried out by a Russian state-sponsored group. It set off some alarm bells on Capitol Hill in the sense of how much reliance the government has on Microsoft. Tell me about the alarm bells in Washington State at your headquarters. You know, when you uh, have an adversary who is a nation state or a country that is, you know, got institutional sort of or, you know, strength or organizations that are both well resourced and are relentless in attacking, I'm glad that we have the capability we have to even detect uh, what they're doing. I really, really hope, whether it's the U.S., it's about Russia or China in particular, these are the three powers who need to come together and really settle on some Geneva Convention. Because if this is about two nation states attacking each other, and especially civilian targets, then we are in a very new world uh, order. And it's a breakdown of world order, which I think we have not seen before.
That was Lester Holt speaking exclusively with Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella. Time for our weekly checkup. They say if you want to remember something, you should write it down. Well, a new study from Frontiers in Psychology shows that may be true. Definitely true for me. If you're looking to shed any extra holiday pounds also, doctors say a traditional Korean dish might help you with that. Let's bring in NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azard. Help us break down some of these health headlines. Good to have you with us. So we're actually going to start nice. with migraines. Yes. Anyone who's had one, yes. and you know this Major. well, knows how much they can be. But now. Yeah. there's some maybe signs of how you could maybe see if one is coming talk more about what we should be looking anyone at. anyone listening who has migraine will understand that if there was a way to predict when you're gonna have a migraine so that it could be life-changing if you don't take right? your medicine it right away enough, it doesn't work to abort yeah. the to abort the headache so this study looked at if you could track certain symptoms like your mood stress levels energy levels as well as your sleep and could that predict a headache the next day and what they found was that if you had if you slept poorly and had a lot of low energy the day before you were more likely to have a morning headache and if you had a ton of stress and a ton of energy the day before it was more likely to predict an afternoon headache biologically I don't know why that's the case but I just found it interesting nonetheless and I'm sure other people have other triggers that they have well identified for themselves so my doctor's orders are to track I have my daughter has migraines I'm like was it the food you ate was it your this was it your that but I think this you know study points to some new things that people can look at and intervene right we talked about that Savannah mm -hmm. if you if you knew you had a bad sleep and energy the day before have those medicines at the ready and if at the first sign of that headache you want to take your medicine to abort a full attack yeah it's so helpful if you catch it in yes. time otherwise you could be all, done for all the multiple days for multiple days terrible. exactly um this one actually kind of reminds me of you funny which is <laughs> handwriting um may kind of I don't know help you remember things be a little bit more impactful than typing than something type. like I know you like to write I'd write actually. my stories yeah, but exactly. yeah but I do I also find like if I write a name down I'm more likely to yes. remember. Right. right. So yeah. I think most people who read this and say oh if you handwrite versus typing into a computer you may remember more I think most of us hear that and go yeah I think that makes sense and when I first heard the study I thought is this just because when I was growing up we weren't typing into laptops and it's just the way you learn mm. well no this study actually studied a bunch of students and they had and they tested how elaborate their brain connections were versus with handwriting versus typing into a computer and in fact they found that areas of the brain that are involved in memory and encoding new information had more elaborate connections when they wrote things as opposed to hmm. typing so my doctor's orders are where you can jot down notes jot down your grocery list instead of always relying on you know phones and things like that hmm. keep a journal practice the writing because I think that really can help obviously balanced with we need to all be up to date on technology yes. we're not going to take <laughs> our computers away from our children but I think it's just interesting in terms of learning especially for kids it's, but us too yeah I mean for me it's creativity I write the first draft of my stories by hand yeah. I just find Isn't I'm more that creative that way yeah but yeah he anyway. has this notebook though where like he writes everything <laughs> even like the sound it bites looks from a, a person. little out of control that's a lot of information, <laughs> lot of information let's talk about okay. kimchi yes. shall we all right the fermented Korean vegetable yes. dish my, good for obesity I know my first when I read this I was yeah. like there is no way that that there's no way <laughs> I don't Joe like kimchi, kimchi actually I don't really? kimchi. Yeah, I'm good it's so anti okay so <laughs> kimchi is a, is no a way I know, no way he likes it okay so um, <laughs> fermented vegetables yeah. are super healthy we know this right yeah. for our gut and digestion um, and there's a certain probiotic um, that contains the, the live bacteria certain bacteria that is super super good for digestion but in animal studies showed that it actually prevented obesity like in mice and other animals so they wanted to look these researchers if people who ate a diet high in kimchi could it prevent obesity and they found that one to three servings a day did lower the risk of obesity but here's the, the clincher if you start eating too much be careful why doctor's orders watch out for the salt intake oh. and also rice and all the other things that you could be mm. eating could actually cause weight gain and don't overdo it right so one to three servings was kind of the Goldilocks amount for Joe's kimchi <laughs> Give it a shot. So, there you go. I don't know how to prepare kimchi, but, but I enjoy <laughs> yeah, it in a restaurant. You can purchase it. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Always. Azar, as always. <laughs> Thank you. You bet. <laughs> Coming up, we are going to peer into Apple's bold vision of the future. What you need to know about the company's jump into mixed reality next.
Welcome back. Well, Apple's newest device, the Vision Pro headset, is set to go on sale Friday, but it comes with a hefty price tag of $3,500. While some say it's a game changer, others are asking if it's worth the price. Well, I got to try it out for myself. Here's my experience with the Apple Vision Pro. Apple's foray into mixed reality with its Vision Pro headset hit stores Friday, but NBC News tech contributor Joanna Stern helped us get an early look. This thing does a lot of cool things but it is a first generation product. And at $3,499, it's a pricey product, calling into question. Who's this for right now? There's probably two groups of people this is for, Apple diehards and then software developers who are thinking about developing their apps for this new platform. I just had to put my contacts in. Yeah, you can't wear glasses with it, but you can get these special lens inserts with your prescription and it works great. Your eyes, now essentially your cursor. It is amazing how it knows what I'm looking at. And a simple pinching movement replaces a mouse click. This command center feeling is really interesting. and It's very designed unique. for office work, like could... entertainment, even household chores. If we were cooking, you'd have that up on the right-hand side of your kitchen. So let's make a timer for five minutes. Pinch and hold and drag it over here to this. <sighs> wow. Tech enthusiasts do have their critiques, including the headset's weight and the external battery pack. It's bulky, it's heavy, it has a short battery life, it can be buggy, but it is very cool. What makes this different is that you are seeing your real world. And possibly a glimpse of the future through tech-tinted glasses. Apple's Vision Pro headset is the company's first major new gadget to hit the market since the Apple Watch debuted in April 2015. If you get a shot to try it out, it is pretty You're fun. buying them for everyone. Right? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's get into some financial headlines. A Delaware judge is saying no to the landmark multi-billion dollar compensation package of Tesla CEO Elon Musk. CNBC Silvana Hanau has that and some other money news for us. Hey, Silvana, good morning. Savannah Joe, good morning to you. Yes, yeah, so a judge has voided Elon Musk's record-breaking $56 billion pay package from Tesla, calling it an unfathomable sum that isn't fair to shareholders. The ruling erases the largest pay package in corporate America. The judge finding it was negotiated by board members who seemed too close and beholden to Musk. In her ruling, she asked whether the plan was even necessary to keep Musk as CEO. The move stems from a shareholder lawsuit filed in 2018. Musk and Tesla are expected to appeal. Byron Allen may soon be SpongeBob's new boss. The reports say the media mogul has made a $14 billion offer to buy Paramount Global. Allen's plan is to sell Paramount's film studio, real estate, and some intellectual property while keeping the TV channels, including Paramount Plus, and run them more efficiently. Paramount, the parent company of CBS, Comedy Central, Nickelodeon, MTV, and other channels has been in play for months. Allen owns the Weather Channel and several local TV stations. And the Baltimore Orioles are on the verge of being sold. Reports say David Rubenstein and Mike Arrighetti have struck a deal to buy the team from the Angelos family for $1.7 billion. Peter Angelos has owned the Orioles since 1993, but has been in declining health for several years. Rubenstein, the co-founder of private equity firm the Carlisle Group, Carlisle Group and outgoing chairman of the Kennedy Center, um, Arrighetti is CEO of investment firm Ayers Group. Now, Major League Baseball would still have to approve the sale, guys. Mm, all right. Savannah, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Well, if you're someone who likes balling on a budget, you're not alone. According to a recent Wells Fargo survey, millennials with $250,000 to more than a million dollars in assets are more likely to lie or exaggerate their finances to appear more wealthy. It's all part of this growing trend called bougie broke or bougie on a budget. This is where people are living outside of their means to give the impression of a luxurious life. <laughs> Joining us now to discuss is Emily Irwin. She is the Managing Director of Advice and Planning for Wells Fargo. Emily, good morning. Good to have you here for a fun one. Good morning. <laughs> Interesting one. So take us through, I know this is based in, in real findings here that y'all have. What did you learn about this kind of bougie broke, I'm not sure if that's what you guys are officially calling it at Wells Fargo, <laughs> but what is it exactly that millennials are doing that's giving that impression? 
Absolutely. They, so the biggest finding from our research study is that millennials are having a real difficulty tying their financial goals to their spending and their savings behaviors. 60% mm. of millennials have told us that the appearance of looking wealthy is important to them. Mm. And 40% indicated that visible wealth is key. As a result, we're seeing behaviors such as splurging on things like homes and cars and luxury goods in a way that they can't fund those purchases and very often are taking on debt in order to do so. I'm guessing inflation wow. accelerated the broke aspect of this. Is that right? <laughs> inflation is certainly not hurting, uh, it's helping, Joe. Yeah. And so inflation's hitting the pocketbooks of millennials every single day, from the grocery store to childcare expenses. In addition, though, it's really compounded by the fact that for many millennials, they are starting to repay their student loans, which were on hiatus for three years. And then, of course, we have interest rates. And interest rates are not helping when you're thinking about those big purchases like a home. So millennials are having to take that dollar and either save it for longer or adjust their expectations downwards, which we now know they don't want to do mm. in order to fund those big purchases. What does this mean long term? Like, what should somebody keep in mind before they're buying a bunch of expensive things that, that you know, maybe they're really stretching to, to try to get? I mean, what does this mean for, for the rest of kind of like your life planning when it comes to your finances? I'm totally confident that millennials are going to figure it out. Every generation before them has as well, but they are growing up in an in a environment where social media is key. Everyone can Google what they paid for their house or how much that handbag they're carrying costs. I'd say three things. Take advantage of time. Time is on their side. You want to get real about having conversations about money and getting comfortable with that. Secondly, you want to be able to really dial into what are your goals, put them on paper. I personally love putting a picture with them and continues to inspire me oh. every time I look at that picture love to that. keep like the a course. Mood board. Uh, yeah. Exactly. And then finally, pick a sustainable plan. You want to be sure that you are doing financial behaviors that you can continue and that in six months you're not going to give up. Mm. Emily Irwin, very interesting. Thank you for being our bougie broke expert today. <laughs> Thank we you so appreciate much for you having me. <laughs> Coming up, we are getting an up close look at the clean energy revolution. Next, how the answers to the future may be found in the past. Stay with us. Seems a lot of internet users need a heart to heart with Sesame Street's Elmo. The beloved red puppet wrote on X, Elmo is just checking in. How is everybody doing? A simple question, but it certainly opened the floodgates. Actress Rachel Ziegler wrote back, resisting the urge to tell Elmo oh. that I am kind of sad. Aww. Accounts for celebrities, brands, and ordinary folks replied, bringing up everything from climate change to the Baltimore Ravens mm. playoff loss. The New York Times described it all as a yawning chasm of despair. Wow. Later, Sesame Street's official X account shared mental health resources, Aww. and Elmo himself said, Elmo learned that it is important to ask a friend how they are doing. That's not how he said it, though. No, but <laughs> I'm not doing Elmo's voice. Elmo! <laughs> I'm, wearing, I'm already it. wearing Elmo's colors this morning. <laughs> I don't need to do perfect. Elmo's voice. You can make a meme out of you. Oh, my God. That right. is true. Thank okay. you, Elmo. Yes, there we go. All right, well, we're going to end this hour with a closer look at the clean energy revolution. Experts predict wind and solar power will be the driving force behind renewable energy growth in the coming years. But to understand the future of clean energy, NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber takes us back to look at a time when solar panels and wind turbines were more of a curiosity than a concrete idea. The path to a cleaner grid will be harnessing the power of nature in 2024. You're going to generate the wind here, I mean the energy here, and be able to transmit all the way across Arizona into California as well. Wind energy will take a big leap with the construction of the Western Hemisphere's largest wind project. Towering steel turbines will capture, then deliver wind-produced power hundreds of miles away. Meanwhile, in the North Atlantic, ocean-based wind farms are taking shape. After a week-long journey from Portugal, components to the country's first commercial-scale offshore wind project have arrived here in New Bedford. America's top commercial fishing port, a place that more than anywhere else in America knows what it's doing out at sea. The pace of solar is also picking up at the federal level, from installing panels on the roof of the Pentagon 
to developing millions of acres of public land for solar use. The modern era of clean energy has come a long way since the dreams of Jimmy Carter. A generation from now, this solar heater can either be a curiosity, a museum piece, an example of a road not taken, or it can be just a small part of one of the greatest and most exciting adventures. It was a symbolic gesture back then, but Carter's 1979 solar speech was more than just a symbol. It was a vision taking root. Harnessing the power of the sun to enrich our lives. A blip on the energy radar entering the 1980s. Solar power was far from mainstream back then. Molten silicon, the raw material of the solar revolution. This is the front line in the campaign to generate electricity from the sun. Solar power has shed its price tag over the decades from more than $100 per watt to under $1 today. And now solar projects are adding clean power to cities and towns across America. Tonight, there are plans to build a solar farm on more than 600 acres in the Foley area to power more than 8,000 homes. Foley's population is a little more than 22,000. How many homes can this operation power? So we can produce up to 180 megawatts, which is about 36,000 homes. The future of clean energy is full of revolutionary ideas that go far beyond turbines and panels. We're seeing a boom in residential uh, energy. It's about batteries. It's about load management. It's about heat pumps. It's about generators and EV chargers all coming together. And the money is pouring in. Over the next five years, global investment in renewable energy is set to skyrocket from $330 billion today to almost half a trillion dollars by 2028. A green rush, once a distant idea, now fueling hope for a greener tomorrow. Our thanks to Ellis and Barbara for that report. That is going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Stay with us, though, because the news continues right now. Good morning. Thanks for being with us this Wednesday. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Developing right now on Morning News Now, pivotal moment. President Biden confirms he has now made the high stakes decision over how America will retaliate to that deadly drone strike that killed three U.S. service members. But now Iran is warning that any attack on its territory will not be taken lightly. We are covering this consequential back and forth in just a moment. In Washington, historic impeachment efforts are underway in the House. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas under scrutiny by Republicans over America's ongoing border crisis. Now the secretary is now responding to what House Democrats are calling a politically motivated sham. Today, the chief executives of some of the biggest names in social media are set to be grilled by lawmakers. At issue, their efforts to keep kids and teens safer online. But some parents are now calling on Congress to put even more pressure on these global social superpowers. We're going to bring you their stories later in the hour. Plus, it is the viral mug that's famous for being almost physically indestructible. Well, now its online reputation might be cracking under the pressure. We're going to bring you Stanley's response to concerns about lead in one of its most popular products. New development in the Stanley Cup store. That's right. You only need to be concerned about if you can even get your hands on one. There, there you go. <laughs> we'll get to that in a little bit. Let's begin this hour with new developments in the drone attack that killed three U.S. soldiers in Jordan on Sunday. Yeah, President Biden said yesterday he had reached a decision on how to respond to the attack, which the White House blames on Iran-aligned groups. NBC's chief international correspondent, Kir Simmons, has more from northern Iraq. Hey there, good day to you. U.S. officials now saying this campaign could last for weeks, telling our Pentagon team it's expected to include Iranian targets outside of Iran, kinetic and cyber operations, and is likely to include targets in multiple places, several countries and locations. President Biden under intense pressure this morning after confirming he has decided how to respond to the weekend's deadly drone strike on a U.S. base. Yes. 
The three American service members were killed by the explosives-laden drone that evaded defenses at their base in Jordan. The leader of one group, strongly suspected of the attack, saying it's suspending military operations in the region, likely a reaction to expected U.S. strikes. The U.S. skeptical the attacks will stop. Actions speak louder than words. While the president is still wary of a growing conflict. I don't think we need a wider war in the Middle East. He was pressed by NBC's Gabe Gutierrez whether he blames Iran for the attacks. I do hold response, responsible in the sense that they're supplying the weapons to the people who did it. But a different group, supported by Iran, striking the U.S. again overnight. The Houthis firing an anti-ship cruise missile towards the Red Sea. Shot down by a U.S. destroyer, the USS Gravely, the Pentagon says. Tensions and the fallout from the war in Gaza growing on multiple fronts, while the families of the service members killed in the strikes in Jordan are still reeling. The army announcing two of those killed, Kennedy Sanders and Brianna Muffet, have been posthumously promoted to the rank of sergeant, recognising their exceptional courage. I just want to say thank you to everybody that sent us prayer requests. So we just want to say thank you. Oh. Meanwhile, the commander of Iran's Revolutionary Guard saying in a statement, we hear threats coming from American officials. We tell them that they've already tested us and we now know one another. No threat will be left unanswered. Meanwhile, U.S. officials telling NBC News that the targets have not been finalized, but underscoring the multidimensional nature of the challenge for President Biden, the director of the CIA, saying that he believes the crisis around Gaza has emboldened Iran. All right, Kira, thank you so much. We're learning new details this morning about that deadly Israeli military raid inside of a West Bank hospital. Palestinian officials say Israeli commandos disguised themselves as doctors to gain access to the hospital. Three people were killed during the raid. Now Israel is facing backlash for the move as pressure grows for a deal to free Israeli hostages. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley joins us from Tel Aviv with the latest on all this. Matt, good morning. Good morning, guys. Well, the deal to free those Israeli hostages and Americans is coming along, but slowly. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan met with some of the families of those six American hostages yesterday to reassure them of the administration's commitment to get them home. Today, growing fallout after that daring Israeli raid in a West Bank hospital that killed three Palestinians. Commandos disguised as doctors and medics, even carrying a wheelchair and a baby doll as props. One of the slain fighters was from Hamas, and two were from Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the group said in statements. The Palestinian Authority called it a massacre, and human rights groups said hospitals should be off limits from war. Israel said the militants were using the hospital as a hideout as they planned terror attacks. Hospitals should not be used for that purpose, and once they are being used for that purpose, they don't have any immunity. As fighting continues on multiple fronts, there were new strikes in northern Gaza. While the world waits on word from Hamas on a long-awaited hostage negotiation deal. But Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu yesterday rejecting two key Hamas priorities, saying Israel won't withdraw the Israel Defense Forces from the Gaza Strip and won't release thousands of terrorists. Netanyahu has faced mounting pressure from the hostages' families who've protested for months demanding their loved ones return. But some right-wing Israeli politicians have opposed a deal that might put prisoners back on the streets. So we are basically looking at a situation where you have to ask yourself, what's the limits? Where do you draw the line? Because the extortion could be potentially um, um, endless. And we may be seeing some progress on the Palestinian side. Hamas has said that they've been invited to Cairo to finish these talks. Joe? All right, Matt Bradley, thank you. Well, House Republicans are moving forward with an impeachment inquiry that could make Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas just the second cabinet official to be impeached in U.S. history. Just after midnight, the Homeland Security Committee voted along party lines to push the two articles of impeachment forward. This follows a year-long investigation led by Republicans who claimed that Mayorkas failed to comply with federal immigration laws in his management of the southern border crisis. Democrats on the committee have called the investigation against Mayorkas, quote, a politically motivated shame.
NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles joins us on this now. Ryan, good morning. So first, catch us up on this debate. It went well into the night. What did we hear from both sides? Yes, yeah, Savannah. In fact, the final vote didn't happen until most of us were sound asleep uh, around 1 a.m. this morning. Uh, and it was along party lines, uh, 18 Republicans, 15 Democrats uh, voting to advance this to the full House. And it was a lot of partisan back and forth. And Democrats had the opportunity to just offer up amendments to this resolution. And they just kept doing that over and over again to extend the process uh, and demonstrate what they believe uh, is a political stunt by Republicans to try uh, and muddy up the immigration debate and, and lay the blame uh, on the immigration crisis right at the feet of Alejandro Mayorkas, the Homeland Security Secretary, and of course, by extension, President Biden. Uh, the sum total of it all, though, was exactly what we expected. This will now go to a full House vote probably sometime next week. So S Secretary Mayorkas himself is in talks with the Senate to try and pass this border security package we've been talking about for several days now. He wrote a letter to the panel saying the accusations don't rattle him. He remains devoted to serving the public. What else are we hearing from Secretary Mayorkas? And at some point, could we see him testify in his own defense? Yeah, you know, Joe, that, I think that's one of the interesting aspects of this debate is that there is actually quite a bit of common ground between Republicans and Democrats that there is a problem on the border. Where it gets caught up is in the political back and forth about it as a potential campaign issue. And what Secretary Mork has said in his response to the committee uh, as they're looking to impeach him is that he is interested in new legislation to try and solve this problem. He has been a part of these negotiations, as you rightly point out. In the letter, he says the problems with our broken and outdated immigration system are not new. Our immigration laws were simply not built for 21st century migration patterns. And so, you know, this immigration debate, uh, it's been happening a long time. This isn't a new issue by any stretch of the imagination, and it's always been so divisive, that divisiveness on full display during this hearing last night. Ryan, you mentioned a little bit about next steps here, but, but tell us more in depth. House Speaker Mike Johnson has promised to move these articles of impeachment against Mayorkas to the floor quickly. What will that look like? Yeah, in fact, the speaker out with a statement this morning. He called this a solemn process, but he said it was the duty of the House uh, to move this process forward. It will now go to a full House vote sometime next week. That that can pass with just a simple majority, but it is no guarantee, primarily because Republicans have such a thin majority. If they lose just two votes, that could potentially stop this from moving forward. If they do end up passing the articles of impeachment, it then moves to the Senate, who, which will be forced to hold a trial. Uh, that will be a public setting. It will certainly be part of the campaign as a result. But it is a very unlikely, almost impossible, that it actually leads to a conviction. That would require two-thirds of senators voting against it. Of course, Democrats do control the Senate. And if you were convicted, that would ultimately lead to some sort of a penalty, which could be removal from office. That also is very unlikely. Unlikely. So what this ends up being, as these things often do, is a political football that both sides are going to use either for or against, uh, depending who is running for office. Uh, and it comes a time where there are lives at stake. This is a humanitarian crisis along the border. And it also gets right in the middle of these uh, bipartisan negotiations around a border package, which is aimed at solving this problem. Uh, there is a very good chance that there's going to be just too much politics at play in order to get that over the finish line. All right. All right, Ryan Nobles, thank you very much. Staying on Capitol Hill, five CEOs of some of the most popular social media companies on the planet are set to appear at a Senate hearing later today. They are facing some tough questions from lawmakers about child safety on their platforms. NBC News Now anchor Kate Snow joins us with more on this. Kate, good morning. Good morning, Joe. This is the hearing room. We expect it to be full of parents later this morning who have lost children because of something that happened to them on a social media site. The CEOs of Meta and TikTok are coming here appearing voluntarily, but the CEOs of Snapchat, X, and Discord have never testified before, and they're here because they were issued subpoenas by this committee. The hearing is supposed to focus on the dangers of children seeing sexual content or being exploited, but we expect a wide range of questions. This morning, the top bosses of Meta, TikTok, Snapchat, X, and Discord called before Congress to answer for what lawmakers call a crisis for America's kids, sexual exploitation happening through those platforms. The numbers that come back to us tell us the exploitation of children is growing by leaps and bounds. And what are we doing about it? 
we're clinging to an old law which basically exempts this industry from liability. NBC News reached out to all five companies who say they are committed to keeping kids safe on their platforms and plan to outline their safety measures at today's hearing. Mm -hmm. But for some, these measures haven't gone far enough. We sat down with a young woman named Ellen outside Dallas. In 2019, when she was 14, she joined Snapchat and started chatting with a person she thought was a teen like her, but was actually an older man. He ever send you photos? Yes. Inappropriate photos? Mm -hmm. Naked photos? Yes. More than once? Correct. Snapchat says in part, what happened to Ellen is horrific, illegal, and against our policies, and we work diligently to prevent predators from misusing and abusing Snapchat. But parent advocacy groups say more needs to be done, and not just in cases of sexual exploitation, but with harassment and bullying, issues of body image, mental health, and drug sales. Sam Chapman organized dozens of parents who will be at the hearing today wearing black and holding photos of the children they lost after incidents involving social media. We first told the story of his son Sammy in 2021. He was 16 when a drug dealer connected with him on Snapchat and gave him a counterfeit pill containing fentanyl. Sammy overdosed in his bedroom. I interviewed his parents just days later. He was on the floor and gone. I'm so sorry. Today, Sam Chapman wants all the CEOs put under pressure. What we're hoping is that there's some very pointed questions about why they're letting so many children die on their platforms, why they're letting so many children be abused on their platforms without changing it. Look, there are a number of bills meant to protect kids online being considered here in Congress, but unclear if any of those will move through. They'll come up today for sure. Snapchat has endorsed one piece of legislation called the Kids Online Safety Act, and today we'll hear the new, new head of X say that they also think that that bill should advance. All the CEOs, Joe, are going to tout the work that they're doing, but look, there are clearly gaps. All these companies, for example, will let you sign up for their sites with a birthday that they don't verify. And that's how that adult man was able to talk to Ellen and, and really get her in, in trouble. We'll have more on Ellen's story tonight on NBC Nightly News. Joe. All right, Kate, as always, thanks for your reporting on this. We appreciate it. Let's now get a check of your morning news now forecast. Meteorologist Angie Lastman joins us with a look. Hey, Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. You might be wondering, where did winter go? If you live in the middle of the country, you're for sure asking yourself that because we've got temperatures running 10, 15, even more than 20 degrees above normal for this time of year. So feeling a little more like spring than winter. We've got mid 60s on tap today for Denver this afternoon. Minneapolis 54 degrees. We could see a record in multiple spots across the, the country. Uh, daily records and potentially even January records. So we'll wait to see how that shakes out. But tomorrow Wichita set to hit 71 degrees. Cincinnati into the low 50s. Chicago into the low 50s. Dallas will head to the low 70s. We'll start to see things turn a little cooler here as we get into the end of our work week and back into our upcoming weekend. We've got temperatures back down to the low 50s for Richmond, New York, ends up into the low 40s. So yes, we'll we'll start to see things kind of get back to where they should be, but we've got a couple more warm days between now and then. Speaking of uh, some, some things that we've seen across the country, if you've been noticing in New York City that you haven't seen the sun in a while, you're not going crazy. It's been eight consecutive days without sunshine in New York City, and it's not just New York City. A lot of folks across the Northeast haven't seen the sun in a while. It has been a long Hall, but the good news is there's going to be a couple of breaks of sun through the day today, so you'll get to finally see that glowing ball of uh, light in the sky. It won't last for long. We'll still see uh, some clouds working through that region, but at least it's not the heavy rain that they're dealing with out west. We're going to see a heavy uh, kind of couple of days of rain across this region with the Pacific Northwest stretching down into portions of California already wet this morning. You can see it's been a soggy one for folks there. We've got the alerts up when it comes to flood alerts, wind alerts, and winter alerts as we're set to deal with this system for the next couple of days. We've got plenty of moisture working closer to the shore through the day today. This is going to bring an enhanced risk of flooding from the Bay Area all the way to Oregon and 
Southern California up through Central California and points north into Washington. Really, we'll see this rain uh, working through here as we get through the day today. By tomorrow, we turn our attention to some snow across the Sierra Range. We'll see some rain across parts of Southern California as well. And then the desert southwest and the Rockies start to see some impacts as far as rain and snow is concerned as we get into the end of our work week. The rain is what's really going to concern us because we could see anywhere from six to 10 inches of rain happening in a short period of time. This goes through Friday. Some of those higher amounts are closer to the coast, up into portions of Northern California, where it doesn't take much to see some flooding there. So of course, we always remind people not to drive through those flooded roadways. And guys, we'll, we'll pick up some snow, which people will be happy about at the ski resorts across the Sierra. Yes, Ridge. four feet, wow. Four feet. <laughs> it's a lot. In the higher elevation, yeah, so. Yeah, no. <laughs> not in LA. Yeah, definitely not. <laughs> that would be newsworthy. All right. Thanks, Angie. Of Got much more to come on this hour of Morning News Now, including some viral backlash that's bubbling over online this morning with the maker of one mega popular cup now playing defense over lead concerns. First, though, after the break, some never before seen video in the ongoing trial of that school shooter's mother, her emotional account to police just hours after her son pulled the trigger. That's next. We are back with new developments in the trial of the mother charged in a deadly school shooting carried out by her son. Yesterday, prosecutors showed the jury never before seen video of the defendant, Jennifer Crumbly, in a squad car saying her son, Ethan, just ruined his life, as well as haunting photos of the boy's bedroom. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa joins us live from Chicago with the latest on this. Hi, Maggie. Good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. Yeah, prosecutors in this case also digging deeper into Jennifer Crumley's inner circle, having her now former boss testify yesterday that she could have taken time off the morning of the shooting to get Ethan counseling. This after school administrators testified that she declined to take her son out of school that morning because she said she had to work. The defense, meantime, continuing to fight back as they prepare to take over this unprecedented case. My son has ruined his life. Caught on camera and now entered into evidence. This morning, the trial of Michigan mom Jennifer Crumley marked by video from the back of a squad car in 2021, hours after her then 15-year-old son Ethan opened fire at Oxford High School, killing four classmates. Crumley crying. Meanwhile, investigators search the family home, finding prosecutors say a whiskey bottle and a BB gun in Ethan's room. On his wall, bullet riddled shooting targets. Prosecutors say they want to wrap up their case this week, arguing Crumbly, who faces involuntary manslaughter charges, ignored warning signs her son could be violent. Her former boss testifying she could have taken time off to get Ethan counseling. I don't know what her what bank she had for PTO, but it wouldn't have mattered to me. This after testimony from two former school administrators who say on the morning of the shooting, they tried to warn Crumbly and her husband James, who also faces charges, that Ethan was exhibiting violent behavior. The defense pushing back, arguing administrators weren't even concerned enough to search Ethan's backpack, which contained a gun. So based on him not caring or showing signs of nervousness, you had no concern there was anything in that bag. I had no reasonable suspicion. An attorney representing victims' families not impressed by the defense's case. Based on what you've heard from the prosecution so far, do you think a conviction is likely? Do you think they're making their case? Yes, absolutely. This kid did what he did and deserved his life sentence that he got too, but they absolutely were the adults. They had a responsibility and they absolutely needed to take their kid to get him help. Now, the now former dean of students, who you also saw in that piece, also testified yesterday that school administrators at the time didn't know Ethan had access to guns. And he said had the parents disclosed that, they would have followed a completely different process. The defense, meanwhile, again, eager to take over this case with Jennifer Crumley, who faces 15 years in prison, expected guys to take the stand. Savannah. All right, Maggie Vespa, thank you so much. Now for some international headlines. Several people are dead after a bus collided with a truck in northern Mexico. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Labanga has that in other world news for us. So Claudio, good morning. 
So, Manager, good morning. Well, that's right. Local authorities in Mexico say that at least 19 people have died and 18 others were injured after a passenger bus collided with a truck. Now, the uh, accident occurred on a highway in the Pacific Coast state of Sinaloa in the north of Mexico. Photos of the scene shows both vehicles have been reduced to burnt out metal frames. The country's civil defense office say uh, there were about 37 people on the bus and that the injured were being treated at local hospitals. The cause of the accident is still under investigation. Let's now go to France, where the National Assembly has passed a historic bill that moves the country one step closer to enshrining the right to abortion in its constitution. The move is seen as a way to avoid that France follows in the footstep of the U.S. after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in June 2022. The bill will now be voted in the Senate and if approved, a special body composed of both chambers of parliament will meet again for its adoption. And if the, ball, the, the bill becomes law, France will become the first country in the world to include abortion rights in its constitution. And let's end this tour of the world in uh, Brazil, where a woman traveling with 130 poisonous frogs in her luggage was arrested on charges of w wildlife trafficking. Well, authorities at the El Dorado International Airport in Bogota found that the harlequin frogs hidden in uh, film canisters now also known as poison dart frogs and clown frogs they produce a highly toxic poison strong enough to kill a small animal and they can fetch up to a thousand dollars each on the black market now the 37 year old woman who was arrested was headed heading to Sao Paulo via Panama and she told customers uh, custom ofi officers there that she received the frogs as a gift from a local community there well, quite a gift Wow. Back to you guys. Oh <laughs> poisonous don't, frogs. Don't give on me a poisonous plane. frogs if you're watching. No, thank you. <laughs> All right, Claudia, thanks. <laughs> now to a shipwreck that left two men stranded in the middle of the ocean in a kayak. Luckily for them, a carnival cruise ship was passing by and spotted them. NBC News correspondent Liz Croyd spoke with a mom from Michigan who saw the whole thing play out. It's not something you'd expect to see from the balcony of your cruise. But for Beth Stalker and her family vacationing on Carnival's newest ship, the Jubilee, this was their view. My daughter and I were having breakfast um, on the ship and we noticed something in the ocean that looked like a boat and it was really small. And I was like, wow, that thing looks like a kayak. Turns out it was these two men stranded in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Isla Mujeres. <laughs> Telling authorities after their boat sank, they got in their kayak to stay afloat. It was kind of crazy. They were really out there, like far in the ocean. Beth started recording this video, capturing the dramatic rescue. The men paddling through the rough ocean water towards the ship, one without shoes or a life vest, finally reaching the rescue teams using rope to pull themselves up the ladder to safety. Did people cheer when they got back on? Was there any reaction? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Like everybody that was on, on their balconies were cheering when, when they got up there. Did they seem in good spirits? They looked very tired. The one guy in front, he he appeared to be just tired and, and just scared. He looked scared. Carnival released a statement saying the men who have not been identified were welcomed onto the ship safely and were evaluated by the ship's medical staff and given first aid and food. The rescue happening in the same rough seas where just hours earlier a boat carrying 19 people capsized between Cancun and Isla Mujeres. Officials say at least four Mexican tourists died. The captain of that vessel is now under investigation, according to Mexican government officials. But for Beth, she's grateful to have witnessed a happy ending and experienced these two lucky men and the passengers watching likely won't ever forget. I'm so happy that, that these guys got rescued. You know, I mean, that's just a terrifying experience to be out there in the huge ocean and, you know, experience that. Our thanks to Liz Kreutz for that report. Carnival says it worked with the Mexican Navy to get the men off the ship, and the Jubilee is now proceeding with its regular schedule through the Caribbean. Wow, what an incredible story. All right, coming up, you could call it a big old cup of controversy. After the break, how the maker of one of the most popular mugs in the world is now responding to viral concerns over lead contamination. Stick around, that's up next.
We are back with one of the most popular cups on the planet. We've been telling you about these Stanley tumbler, tumblers. Well, there have been concerns over lead exposure in their products, and this morning the company is responding. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa joins us now with more on this. Hey, Emily, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning to you. In the same way social media influencers fueled demand for the Stanley Quencher Cup, now alarm bells are ringing on TikTok and Instagram over whether the lead sealed inside the cups makes them unsafe. Oh, I got a Stanley! Just weeks after social media helped make the Stanley Quencher Cup the must-have accessory of the season. I want to see if these Stanleys have lead in them for myself. <laughs> this morning, a wave of TikTokers are testing them for lead and even throwing out the pricey status symbols. The company says its products are safe, explaining on its website that it uses an industry standard pellet to seal the vacuum insulation and the sealing material includes some lead. But it's covered with a durable stainless steel layer, making it inaccessible to consumers. The controversy threatening to slow the momentum Stanley has built with female consumers and influencers. If the green bottle is dead, well, the quencher is his daughter. It's some kind of tough thermos pump. The brand, once associated with macho blue collar workers, is now a $750 million a year juggernaut beloved by women. Now we're all about them big dumb cucks. <laughs> A phenomenon SNL recently played up for laughs and even referenced the controversy. Mmm, you can really taste the bacteria. <laughs> I'm getting lead. So how concerned should you be? There really is practically zero risk of you ingesting any of the lead that's in this cup. Lead exposure expert Jack Caravano says while people shouldn't worry, he's disappointed the company chose to use any amount of lead in its products. We pretty much have stopped using lead in just about every product out there. Stanley also tells NBC News its engineering and supply chain teams are making progress on innovative alternative materials for use in the sealing process, while competitor Hydro Flask posting to advertise its bottles as lead-free, writing, we chose this path because we aimed for a higher standard. A new front in the water bottle battle as Stanley seeks to reassure its customers. Emily, so we're seeing clips of people using at-home testing kits. How reliable are those? So experts say the swabbing for lead, they're not super accurate. And while they can be a good first step, ultimately it's laboratory testing that will be the only way to really know what's in a product, whether it be lead or some other harmful substance. If you do have any questions or concerns about a product, the best place to start is the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Uh, so that's a good place to start. Ask your questions and go from there. All right, Emily Akata, thank you so much. Well, American Heart Month kicks off tomorrow. Each year, heart disease and stroke cause one in three deaths among women, specifically. That is according to the American Heart Association. And this Heart Month, the organization is calling on families to act, urging them to learn the life-saving practice of CPR. Joining us now for more on this is Nancy Brown. She is the CEO of the American Heart Association, as well as Dr. Mike Varshavsky, a board-certified family medicine doctor. Good morning to both of you. Thank you very much Good for being here. Good morning. Important stuff here, and we are so happy to have you help us raise awareness as we're about to kick this month off. One of the things that I know that people are encouraged to do this Friday, National Wear Red Day, and specifically this importance about what women need to know when they're thinking about their heart health. Tell us what it is that women should be aware of and be thinking about. Well, first of all, thank you so much. And Friday is National Wear Red Day, which is a really important day so that we can help raise awareness to women everywhere that heart disease is their number one cause of mm. health concerns. As a matter of fact, heart disease causes more deaths in women than the next five causes of death combined. Wow. So we want women to know their risk factors. We want them to take action, to know their family history. And we want to raise awareness to, for all women to be sensitive um, to their risk for heart disease and stroke. Absolutely. Dr. Mike, let's bring you in and tell us what to look for. Or if you've never really had any heart concerns before, where can you kind of start to just get a baseline with your health? Yeah, I think you need to establish a good relationship with a primary care doctor. Mm. Uh, too often I see young folks start using urgent care as 
their form so of true. primary care. So true. Which unfortunately doesn't work for continuity of care. You want someone who understands your risk, who understands where they can make some lifestyle changes, and therefore reduce heart attack risk, cardiac arrest risk. And I frequently tell people, the things that are within your control are way more powerful than anything that I can put on a prescription pad. Mm. So I motivate people to try and make changes in their lives to lower that heart risk because it's all within our control. Mm, wow, that's really good to hear. <laughs> it makes you think, oh, okay, I could take some of the kind of autonomy back here. Um, Nancy, let's talk about that CPR aspect I mentioned. Um, I know you're partnering with places like TikTok. You really want to get this message out. You really want it to reach young people. Is that right? What is the importance here? And explain this connection. Well, all of February is American Heart Month. And our focus this February is on creating a nation of lifesavers. Mm. We think that every person should have someone in their life around them that knows how to do CPR. And mm -hmm. hands-only CPR is a very easy skill to learn and it can save a lot of lives. So we're teaming up with TikTok. We're launching American Heart Month with a TikTok event that Dr. Mike will be hosting um, that will teach people how to do hands-only CPR in a really fun and amazing way. And it's important because of the about 360,000 out-of-hospital cardiac arrests that happen every year, fewer than 10% of those people survive. Mm. And since Damar Hamlin's cardiac arrest, he, of course, is our national ambassador for Nation of Lifesavers, we have seen what we call the Damar effect, people that are very motivated to learn CPR. Mm. So we're taking it to, you know, the, uh, folks via social media and especially on TikTok, and we're so happy that Dr. Mike is leading the way. Yeah, Dr. Mike, board-certified family medicine, party host, <laughs> yes, TikToker. Exactly. Yes. Well, we got to be the Nation of Lifesavers. And when we do that, we're actually empowering people to literally save lives. Mm. It's sad to see that while the majority of cardiac arrests, someone's heart stopping, happen outside of the hospital, the majority of them don't have a bystander to perform CPR. People are afraid, mm. they're nervous, and they shouldn't be. This is a rather simple process. Step one, you're calling 911, you're calling for help. Because what CPR does is buy time in order for advanced cardiac support to arrive. And sometimes that could mean you calling or you nominating a very specific person. Because yelling into the ether, someone call 911 doesn't work because mm. everyone assumes the other person will call. So you nominate someone specific and then you put one hand on top of the other, push hard and fast in the center of the chest to the tune of good old stay it alive, stay it alive. Stay it alive. But you, and you do wait, like this? Yep. Just interlock interlock those fingers, okay. center of the chest, push hard and fast. Okay. And some people say, what if I'm not doing it perfect? What you're doing it, that's the best step. That's how you buy time for that person for emergency personnel to arrive. And that's it. That's all you need to know to do. Yeah, it. how simple is that? It's very simple, and the, uh, staying alive is the kind of signature beat because it is that 110 to 120 beats a minute. Uh -huh. But we have an entire playlist oh. of songs on Spotify that are of the appropriate beat so that you can learn how to do CPR to your favorite song that has that number of beats. There you go. And spoiler alert, Taylor Swift does have some songs in that BPM range. Who told you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we heard. A little birdie told us. <laughs> that is very, very cool. And I think you're right. You're totally scared, thinking, yeah. am I going to hurt somebody? Do I know what I'm doing? I'm trying to perform some type of medical help on somebody. And demystifying it on TikTok can make such a difference. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, the person is already unresponsive and not breathing. So mm -hmm. all you can do is help them regain their breath and their life. And so, you know, this nation of lifesavers really matters. And we encourage everyone to learn hands-only CPR. It is so easy. And it is a life skill that truly yeah. can save someone's life. Savannah, can you tell we're pumped about Heart Month or what? He's Sorry, I had to do it. If it has <laughs> jokes like that. Nancy Brown, Dr. Mike, thank you both very much. Really, really good to have you come by. Really interesting and important stuff you're doing. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Great to see you. Coming up, it's another big day for your money. We're watching the Federal Reserve about to set the tone for interest rates in 2024, how it could impact your wallet. That is up next.
Welcome back. The Federal Reserve is set to announce its first interest rate decision of the year later today. Economists predict the Fed will keep rates unchanged, but many expect the central bank could provide more hints about future moves. We're always watching for those. Joining us now to talk more about this is NBC News senior business correspondent Christine Romans and Investopedia editor-in-chief Caleb Silver. Good morning, friends. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Love your little cha-ching. <laughs> like that's just for y'all. Special. All right, Christine, let's start with you. Sure. Tell us what you're looking out for. You know, I think the the Fed is not going to move interest rates. It'll stick there at a 23-year high. But what Jerome Powell says is really important. Are they going to drop this so-called tightening bias? And will he suggest when and under what conditions they'll start to cut interest rates mm. later this year? You know, until now, all of the discussion has been, will we need to raise again? Now, I think the discussion is, at what point will we start to cut? But they don't need to cut right now because the economy is strong. I mean, mm. the economy is pretty strong here. Yeah. Caleb, first, countdown clock. Countdown clock, five hours and 28 minutes. But it's the March meeting in 48 days and five yeah. hours and 20 minutes that we want to focus on because that's when we you might one see. one up yourself. I yeah. know, I know. I got these numbers in my head. But that's when we want to, we'll probably see at least hints of the first cut. There's a 50% chance. But to Christine's point, words matter. So is he going to say anything like any additional policy firming? He hasn't said that in a while. We want to see whether they're going to open it up to rate cuts sooner than expected. That's what the market's been expecting. We may not get that. It's so funny because th there's a policy statement from last last time, and then there'll be this new policy statement, and people like us will put it side by side and find the one word mm -hmm. that is right. different, and then we'll know exactly what that one little word difference means in terms of your mortgage rates down the line. It's really kind of a fun puzzle. No, it solve. is. Caleb, and you were the one that really started introducing us to that on this show, just how much every single word. And oh, I yeah. love when we Dead hear Wordle, our quote quotes <laughs> from you after. Um, I mean, the big question though right that everybody's wondering okay so fine great it's good they're pausing thank god they're not going up but when will they be cut Christine yeah. what do you think I mean the market is saying there's a 50 50 chance that the first cut is in March and maybe we'll know more about that later today I mean that that expectation could change a lot I think for a lot of people who are sitting here saying but why, you know I really have this condo I want to buy and right. am I going to get it should I get it now should I wait look if you need to buy the piece of real estate do it and knowing that later this fall is probably when you're going to be able to refinance when those mortgage rates are going to start to decline. But nothing is nothing is set in stone because, honestly, the economy is strong. Inflation has been cooling. It gives the Fed kind of a moment to sit here um, and decide, sit on its hands, really, and decide. We want to make sure that inflation doesn't come back. But you also want to make sure the economy is not too strong. And then you're cutting and then you spin up inflation again, you know? Right. And Christine, any idea how drastic a cut could be? I would say the first one would be a little 25 basis point. Yeah, quarter point, quarter point, quarter point. We'll get down to about 4.6% yeah. by the end of the year. And watch the mortgage rates, watch the credit card APRs, and watch the new car loan rates. Those are all still really high. The 30-year mortgage, 6.9%. Nobody's selling a home, nobody's buying a home, and nobody's refinancing right yeah. now. That will come down ahead of the Fed's cut, and you'll see a reactivity, hopefully, in the housing market by spring. So I'm hearing some takeaways here for the consumer at home, but give me some of those. Housing, cars, that type of thing, and just what it means for people's wallets. Yeah, the big purchases people continue to put off because these rates are too high right now yeah. and home prices are too high. So we got a consumer confidence report yesterday. Consumers feel all right. They're just not planning on making big purchases this year. That could be tough for the economy. We'll see. I would say at 23-year highs and at record highs for APRs on credit cards, this is a really dangerous time for consumers to have money on credit cards. You must pay down the credit card debt. Mm -hmm. Don't hang around with, oh, I'm going to keep some on the on the credit card balance. Credit card debt is deadly for Americans. Mm -hmm. It will stall your path to middle class. That is what these. That is really the biggest takeaway I think of where we've been with with the interest rates in the past year and a half. Right pay down that high interest debt and make sure you're securing your job right now too. Mm. Very much news you can use. Thank you both. <laughs> nice to, to see you. you. By the way, before we let you go, happy birthday, Christine. Oh. <laughs> ah, we had that ready to go. Caleb's an old friend, and he's, he's kept Yeah, out of he's the one who let us know right before. Thank God he did. Christine Thanks. Roman, Thanks Caleb so Silver, thank you both very much. <laughs> Have a wonderful day. Enjoy your special day. Let's stay on financial news. Walmart stock is about to get a whole lot cheaper. CNBC's Silvana Hanau has more on that and some other money news for us. Silvana, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. Yes, so Walmart announcing a three-for-one stock split, the first such move by the retail giant since 1999. Walmart stock rising on the news, close to an all-time high. Companies often conduct stock splits when they feel their share price is too high to attract investors. A split makes it more affordable, especially for small or retail investors. Universal Music says it will stop licensing content to TikTok if it fails to reach a new contract with the social media app to pay its artists, which include Taylor Swift, Olivia Rodrigo, and Drake. The current contract is set to expire today, and Universal claims TikTok has 
proposed paying artists and songwriters at a fraction of the rate other major social platforms pay. Universal says TikTok only contributes about 1% of the company's revenue. And Universal Studios releasing details on its newest and most anticipated theme park. The company, which is owned by NBC Universal parent Comcast, says Epic Universe will feature five new worlds with more than 50 attractions, entertainment, dining, and shopping experiences. These include sections dedicated to Harry Potter, Super Nintendo World, and the How to Train Your Dragon franchise. At 750 acres, Epic Universe will be the largest theme park at Universal Orlando and is scheduled to open in 2025. Cannot wait to check it out. Yeah, so, so exciting. All right, yeah. Savannah, thank you so much. You got it. Well, turning now to what seems to be a changing trend with remote work. We first saw a shift during the pandemic with work from home becoming a dominant theme for many employers. But as we move further into the post-COVID world, that appears to be reversing now that more and more companies are requiring their workers return to the office. Joining us now for more on this is Johnny C. Taylor Jr. He is the CEO of Society for Human Resource Management. Johnny, good morning. Always great to have you with us. Um, let's talk through the return to office policies. Obviously, something so many people are talking about dealing with. They seem to be moving full steam ahead, at least here in New York, where I am. Um, that's according to the Real Estate Board. So as companies continue to have employees return Turn to the office. What does it say about the state of remote work right now and kind of the headspace employees are in? Well, so remote work as we knew it, fully remote in particular, is, is dying. And some would argue is dead. If you talk to human resources leaders and CEOs, it's very clear that we want our employees back in the office. More and more employees, actually, this is kind of interesting, are finding remote work overseas um, with a state of global hiring report, finding that the number of American workers hired by international companies grew. Get this. Look at this number on your screen. 62% last year. Why are we seeing this increase? Why are global employers looking to hire them? Is this because people are looking for a way to stay remote? Well, it's interesting. America's laying off. And so because we're seeing the significant layoffs, you have companies abroad who always wanted that top performing person from a top performing U.S. company, but you couldn't get them. Well, that person's now available through no fault of their own, not performance related, but the company took a new direction to decide to lay off large numbers of employees. You've heard it. Wayfair, Google, tech industry in particular was hit hard. So now these companies outside of the U.S. can actually access that talent. And they, ne they don't necessarily want to bring those folks abroad because there's a cost associated associated with relocating people, expat packages. So they say, these are the people I've always wanted a shot at. I'm going to get them and allow them to work remotely. Mm -hmm. Johnny, a new analysis um, from Live Data Technologies, that, that's who has these numbers, they, they suggested that employees who worked remotely five days a week were more likely to be laid off last year to people who worked in office, comparing those two. Um, you mentioned, look, a lot of times layoffs, it, it's just kind of like the state of the business, right? Or uh, positions being eliminating, not, not a fault of the workers, uh, not a reflection of their skill set or their output. But when we talk about that, about remote versus not remote, why do you think that is? Why would remote workers be the first to be let go? And what should anybody listening at home kind of take away from that stat? Well, you know, frankly, fully remote comes with real risk. There are upsides to it, but downsides. What we know, 42% of supervisors say, I actually forget about my remote employees. Out of sight, out of mind, that adage exists for a reason, and it's because that's what happens. The other thing we know, and there is bias here, we know this, but 70% of supervisors say remote employees are more easily replaced. And 68% of them have told us, we think in-office employees perform better. Again, whether or not that's accurate or not, if that's the sentiment of the managers, right, then employees are at risk when they choose to work fully remotely. Make sure that we're distinguishing hybrid is in. No one is saying come back to the work five days, come back to the office five days a week, nine to five, but they are saying fully remote is not the answer either. Hmm. Johnny C. Taylor, we appreciate you joining on, us on this very important stuff, uh, and lots of people are thinking about it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Coming up, Team USA is making history this morning. It's first ever Olympic figure skating gold medal that's coming two years after the games. We will explain after this. Welcome back. Well, if you ever wanted to get back at your ex, a New Jersey animal shelter has a perfect solution. For just $50, the Homeward Bound Pet Adoption Center will... <laughs> 
<laughs> this is so funny to me. Well, name a feral cat after your ex before it's neutered or spayed. The center posted this hilarious Valentine's Day promotion. It's already raised over $2,000 to cover the cat's surgery cost. Your ex might get their whiskers in a twist. It's all for a good cause. The procedures help lower the population in cat colonies and returns them as part of a trap neuter return program. So that was a real news story that I needed to tell you about. Moving on, Team USA is celebrating a historic moment this morning. The U.S. figure skating team just received its first Olympic gold medal. It comes nearly two years, though, after the Beijing Olympic Games, following the retroactive disqualification of a Russian skater over a positive drug test. Today, anchor Hoda Kotb has a look back at the long, unusual road to gold for these American stars. A monumental victory worth its weight in gold. Nearly two years after their apparent runner-up finish in the team competition at the Beijing Winter Olympics, the U.S. figure skating squad now the rightful winners of the gold medal. This week, the court of arbitration for sport disqualified Russian skater Kamila Valieva. She tested positive for a banned heart medication in the lead-up to the 2022 Winter Games and argued she may have been inadvertently exposed to the medicine her grandfather takes. The ruling ending the ongoing saga by stripping the Russian Olympic Committee of their team win and awarding the top prize to Team USA. It still hasn't sunk in yet. U.S. Olympic team member Vincent Joe speaking to us from his dorm room at Brown University. To be honest, I'm still processing. I probably experienced... 20 new emotions that I don't even know how to describe in English. <laughs> now, nine American skaters are making history as the first U.S. skating team to grab gold. Back in June, Vincent Joe, Brandon Frazier, and Alexa Kinnearum sharing with today how their dreams of a medal ceremony in Beijing dramatically played out as news of Valieva's positive test sent shockwaves through the sports world. We were dressed, ready to go. It was like Christmas morning, going to get our hardware. Yeah. And um, no, they're like, no, this is not happening, not happening. And then they sent us back to our rooms in, in the village. Now, Team USA finally recognized and looking forward to their gold medal moment. Our thanks to Hoda Kotb for that report. Well, the medal ceremony, which usually takes place shortly after Olympic competition, was postponed after details of Valieva's positive test came to light. While no date has been given yet on when Team USA will receive their medals, they are already gold, win gold medal winners in our hearts, in our eyes. And they really are. So there you go. It's exciting stuff. And of course, we've got Paris to look forward to this summer. That's going to do it for this hour of morning news now. But stay with us because the news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.